to our live stream. I'm here today with art prof teaching artist, Jordan McCracken Foster. And we are here today to announce the July Art Dare. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques and tutorials. This Art Dare is called Texture Cubes. And Jordan, this was actually an exercise that I believe you picked up at your graduate school, correct? Yes, so there, there's a whole class just dedicated to doing this very thing. And uh, the whole purpose is to just get really good at painting specific things. So, and, and not worrying so much about all the fancy design of it, because if you could paint this, like if you could paint metal, right? So let's say steel, then when you go to doing a background painting and you know how to paint steel, all you have to do is just apply the same thing and just on a much bigger scale or, or slightly different context. Uh, so that was the whole purpose of the class. I really like this assignment because I think it really isolates this idea of texture because Jordan, remember a million years ago when you were in my class at RISD, oh, yeah. I used to have this project called texture. And so people could just make a drawing that was about any texture they wanted. But we always run into trouble because people couldn't distinguish between the form and the texture. And so it would get really, really confusing. But I just like how with this project, the form is a cube and you can't get away from that. So you can really visibly see the texture very separate from the form. So I like that as an idea a lot. Now, Jordan, I know when you started doing this, it was with actually somebody who ended up being your mentor, right? Yeah, well, he's he'd been my mentor for a while, but when I went to school uh, and I took this class, he he basically like told me this is one of the core classes that's incredibly important, uh, especially as a concept artist, because you have to you have to be able to communicate things without saying it. You have to show, okay, this is a type of metal. This is gold. This is a gummy bear. This is a human body. You know, this is. Uh, a trash bag, whatever. And so you have to get really good at explaining those things and making it very clear as to what you're what you're doing. And you have to be creative about it too. Like um, like what we're seeing here, this is actually a friend of mine. Uh, this is some of her work. And as you can see, she got really creative with some of it. Like the candle, it's, you know, the wax is sort of dripping uh, on the sides and uh, the apple on the far left column, fourth down, it's like split in the middle and it's also a, like a cubed apple. So it's, there's a bunch of fun that you can have with it as well. My favorite Jordan is that little piece of brie with the gooey cheese coming down. Oh yeah. <laughs> I just love that. It's like I, you really can see the surface of that gooey cheese coming out. Oh yeah, these were so good. I remember when she showed the me, uh, showed these to me, I was like, what the heck? Like, why, why, why do you just gotta show off like that? Like, come on, <laughs> these were so stunning. These are amazing. We have a comment from W135Bird. They are asking, are the cubes isometric? Can you answer that, Jordan? Uh, yeah, they're, they're isometric cubes. And, uh, and again, you know, um, that's the base shape. If you are working on something that involves you breaking out of that, like if you're doing the slime or the lava, I'm just pointing to stuff that's already on the screen, um, then those, uh, will, those are fine too. You know, but yes, it's supposed to be an isometric cube. <laughs> I think people are getting into all the food items. We are <laughs> going to definitely explore those for sure. So Jordan, I know that when you started graduate school, you actually didn't have a lot of experience with digital painting. I know you've done some, mm -hmm. but what do you think shifted for you in terms of your digital painting skill after you did this project? Well, starting, well, so yeah, I had, very little to no experience painting digitally, uh, at least not in a focused sense. And so what this class uh, focus on is just the process of how to get there. And by learning how to do this in stages, it helps you, it's sort of like a paint by numbers sort of thing. I know it sounds kind of boring and dull when I say it like that, but it really helped me because I'm just one of those guys that likes like a certain list or a certain schedule or things like that. I'm very particular about that sort of stuff. And so it trained me to be able to put these things together in a much more cohesive way. And, and this is at the beginning. I actually think I need to reduce some of my cues personally. 
Because it wasn't enough for you to have done it once before. You got to do it again. Well, I got to have. <laughs> <laughs> we have a comment from Damara. They are asking, does this have to be done digitally? The answer is no. We are showing you examples of digital paintings because this is the context that Jordan did this project in. But you guys can use anything you want in terms of media. So whatever works. But I think you can see it's really well suited for any media. So it really does not matter at all. Now, Jordan, let's talk a little bit about getting references because it seems like that's a pretty important part of this process. So how do you know what to pick and where to find it? Do you have suggestions for how to people can do that? Uh, yeah, so uh, it's just, it goes like every other time I've talked about like reference, uh, be very specific. And this isn't a character design or prop design or anything like that. It's just paint this material. And so whatever you can find that looks like that material, go for it. So in this example is, uh, I think the project was uh, painting light colored wood. So uh, I found a bunch of references like that, whether it's a chest or a box or just a plank. And I studied that and I used those references in my, uh, in my work. And so, uh, for example, like the, just the wood texture, I had to go in, I, I would look at the, the wood texture that you see on the top right, and I hand painted all of that. That's not, you know, oh, I didn't warp any of that. It was just me going in and saying, okay, shoot, shoot, and making this pattern. And it was really tedious and annoying, but it came out pretty good. Um, and I had to study the knots uh, on the wood as well and you know how that would uh, behave on certain lighting. And so it's, it's a lot of active research, but it's meant to help you because you don't know what everything looks like off the top of your head. It's just impossible. In fact, Jordan, sometimes I feel like I think I know what something looks like, and then I go and I get it, and I'm like, that's not what I thought it looked like at all. And yeah. so I think a lot of this is also just really good visual research, because essentially, I think what exercises like this do is you're basically building a visual vocabulary. Like once you've actually painted wood, that experience doesn't leave you, you retain that experience. And so I feel like it's almost like building this encyclopedia of textures in your head that you can reference later on. Well, looks like you guys are really liking our new feature questions on the screen. It was always there in StreamYard. We just figured it out like two minutes ago. So we're very happy you guys are so impressed with that. And we have another question from Rainia. They are asking, how many should we do? What would be your suggestion, Jordan, in terms of quantity? I mean, the more you do, the better you'll get. Uh, for when, when I was doing this in a classroom setting, we would do six in a week on top of our other classes. And so um, that's so this one right here probably took about three hours, this, um, this white wood painting. And I had to do a bunch of others. This one, this week was actually much easier than the others because I was able to use the same wood texture, <laughs> like the, the little <laughs> strain, like the grain that you guys see. I was able to use that on several of them, and my teacher said it was okay. So that was that made it much easier. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure. Maybe you could do six or ten. Honestly, do however many you want. But just know the more you do, the better you'll get. Um, yeah, I know it's vague, but <laughs> that's the <truth. laughs> I mean, I also think to a certain degree, it also depends on what media you choose, because if I were learning digital media, I don't know anything about it. Oh my goodness, this would take me forever and ever and ever. But if I were doing this in markers, I could probably do them pretty quickly. So I think it depends on the material you choose and what your expertise is in that material. But I think like Jordan said, this project, it's less about making a perfect cube and I think it's more about variety, don't you think? Oh, definitely. Like that's texture cubes. Like the, the whole point is like, let's see you paint all this different stuff. Because again, when you get those assignments in the future, or when you have a personal project that you want to do and you need to paint gold, you need to paint like a gold um, uh, watch or something like that, then you can just refer back to that time you spent six hours painting a golden cube and be like, aha, I know how to do that. And so, you could so you can literally use anything you want. Um, you can like there's uh, there's one painting that I did and it was of a an eraser like a like one of those gummy erasers you know and I did I just did that and or slime or a sponge like literally anything 
has the potential uh, to, to paint. And I think everything deserves equal amount of focus. I mean, I'm looking at this stuff and I feel like I would just have so much fun searching for things to do. And what I would try to do if I were to do this is to pick textures that are as different from each other as possible. And I think if you really are trying to train your skill set, try to pick textures that you're not very good at and that you really think would be a challenge because this really is an exercise to develop your skill. It's so different than last month's dare, which really was about investigating your life experience and being a little bit more personal. This is a very straightforward assignment, but I mean, it looks super fun. I've always wanted to do this. You should. We have a question from Comcuke. How big should we draw them if we're doing it in traditional media? What do you think, Jordan? You know, I've never thought of that. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> I've, I always envision this being digital because as a concept artist, that's primarily what we use. Um, maybe like four to five inches, something like that. Um, nothing so crazy that it takes you forever. Cause again, it's about practice. Um, you, I'll say this, there's, there should be a balance in size because you don't want to make it so small that you can't get any defined details. Like for, like when you try to put a highlight, if you have, if you paint it too small and the smallest brush you have is the super thick, you, you will leave a super thick line on it, then that's not gonna look good. But if you are spending four months painting this very delicate, you know, cube that's seven feet tall, then you probably need to scale it down a little bit. So, uh, so that's why I say maybe five, four or five, six inches, something like that should work. Yeah, I would just do a couple and I think you guys will find your way in terms of the media and you guys can always switch media. I mean, if you want to do three in acrylic paint and you decide, oh, that's not such a great material. I want to switch to colored pencil. It's really, really open ended. You guys, you can structure it as however you want it to be. We have a question from Ashley. What were the most difficult textures for you to do? Oh man. Um, for me, it's food. Food is incredibly <laughs> difficult because with everything else, it's static, you know, um, you know, like a box or, you know, type of clothing or something like that. But when you paint food, you're not just painting food, you're trying to make it look edible and you want it to look like something you would want to eat yourself. Like, I think everyone here appreciates a good meal on some level. There, there's some times where you'll just look at a dinner plate and, you know, you'll just get that sensation like, I can't wait to dig in. And then there's times where you just smell it and it's in the next room and you want to go throw up. So <laughs> um, where are you eating, Jordan? I'm just look, there, so there was one time uh, I went into the kitchen and someone was making Brussels sprouts and it had the whole house smelling terrible. And it was just so disgusting. And I don't even dislike Brussels sprouts like that when you do it right. But that just threw me off so much. And I'm like, Ugh. Uh, so food is really difficult because I, I think the trick is you have to get a, a nice saturation on it and you have to make it look edible. Like, why wouldn't you, why would you not want food to look like you want to crave, you know, you should make it, someone crave the food that you're painting. So yeah, that's always been a challenge for me. Yeah. And I feel like what's really fun, actually, I mean, I, I sort of thought at first when I saw this project, oh, this is pure technical exercise. It's just about training that skill set. But isn't it funny to almost psychoanalyze what objects people select? Because oh. I'm looking at Ruth's here. Ruth was a former student of mine and she worked on art prof for a very long time. And the thing about Ruth that I remember is she told me in high school that she used to make these elaborate lunches for herself. So she's a real foodie. And I looked at this, I'm like, this is so Ruth. Like this totally to me, this selection of textures screams her personality. And so I don't know if that's something you guys thought about in the class, but I think it's really interesting because you get a sense of who people are from the textures. And I'm curious to know those of you guys who live outside the US and people, I mean, I was just telling Jordan before, like you go to a different country and it's like all the candy is different, you know? Like, I just love that. And I would love to see you guys, your personalities show up in these cubes. I think that'd be so much fun. Let's see, we have a comment from Grace. 
they are saying, I'm already looking at things around my house to study. Do you think that's a good way to get started, Jordan? Oh, heck yeah. I remember um, for a completely different class, we had an assignment to do like basic geometric shapes. And I was looking around my table and I was like, all right, I have a roll of tape, I have a lamp, and I have like a sharpener. <laughs> and I just sat and I drew that for like two hours. So that's a great method. And you don't have to spend any money. So it's great. <laughs> well, actually, Jordan, I have a question because Obviously, if you look online, you're going to have way more options. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend that people try to do this from life? Do you think it doesn't matter? What's your recommendation as far as the reference? Uh, I think, I don't know if it really matters, to be honest, because all you're trying to do is just study how it looks. Um, like, for example, if you're trying to paint fur, um, like, let's say tiger fur, I imagine most people don't have tigers sitting in their backyard. So in that situation, it might be really good to get some reference. Uh, and if you do, I hope you're being safe with that tiger. <laughs> you know, uh, but you know, there are some times where you just don't have access to things. Um, there might be a certain metal. I don't, I don't have anything gold in my house. Like, how am I gonna? You know, <laughs> like, what am I gonna do? <laughs> so I got some reference online. And so, uh, yeah, d definitely. Uh, the the one thing I will say is you you want to make sure you have a consistent reference for lighting. So uh, if you have some type of cube, or if you even go online and just look at th those basic art, like how to draw books, and they show you how shadows work and everything, stay consistent with something like that, um, and then with everything else, just have fun with it. You know, I think that's the biggest thing. You just want to make sure you have fun because. It can be very aggravate, aggravating at times when you're like, it's not looking right. And you can't beat yourself up over it. So have fun with it, try something new, and just enjoy yourself. Well, Jordan, why do you think the lighting matters? Because I think that you might think at first, oh, well, it's just the texture. What is the difference that the lighting makes in the experience of this project? OK, so let me put it like this. Um, if my room were completely pitch dark, I could not paint any of that texture. Uh, I would not be able to see anything. So lighting gives a lot of information as to what you're actually looking at, obviously. And so when you have the right lighting set up, uh, it makes it so much more powerful and it helps you to understand things. So like with this example with the chocolate, uh, I paid a lot of attention to that caramel that I was painting and I was like, okay, how would light reflect off of that object? Uh, and then where the highlights were gonna go, I had to figure out not just on the caramel, but on the chocolate on the top. And I would like, I would think like, okay, how does this work? Is it too shiny? Uh, because sometimes you can make it look, uh, you, just by the highlights you use, you can either make it look like silk or you can make it look like a rock. You can make it look, you know, like a piece of wood like we have here. So you have to pay a lot of attention to those things because sometimes just, leaving something off is better than putting some some extra texture or lighting on there. I mean, when I think about texture, what makes texture effective for me in any artwork is a feeling of tactility. You ever look at a painting, Jordan, and you just feel like you want to run your fingers <laughs> through it? It's like yeah. the fur or the silk. It's so visceral and it gives you that really tactile experience. And that for me is a compelling reason to learn how to do texture. Because I remember when I was a lot younger, I never thought about texture. I used to think actually, ooh, the smoother, the better. But the thing is, I think that's actually why a lot of digital paintings have that stereotypical digital look is that things are too smooth yeah. and they're too perfect. And I feel like that's what texture does is it makes things a little bit flawed, which then in turn makes them feel, I think a little bit more natural. What do you think? Oh, definitely. I mean, everything has a completely different look and feel to it. Um, like if I'm just looking around my room, I have things that are plastic and I have things that are metal and they look different and you can tell just by looking at them. And I think the challenge is sometimes we, uh, we're so used to seeing these things in everyday life that when we try and go and paint it or draw it, suddenly everything just evaporates from our mind and we forget all the stuff that we studied kind of, um, uh, subconsciously for you know 10 15 20 30 years or whatever however long you've been alive and that's where the challenge comes in like i assume everyone on the stream has seen another human before 
However, painting skin is one of the most difficult things to paint, even though you've seen it and most people I assume are wrapped up in it <laughs> in a big coat of skin. Literally. Me. I, I, I would hope so. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna make it. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, like it's it's incredibly challenging. And so and that, and again, food. We have to eat food every day to survive. And yet it's still very difficult. So studying that, understanding that texture is incredibly important. We have a comment from Ashley. They are saying the texture I have the most difficulty with is metal. I never know where and how to place the light and shadow. Any tips for metal objects, Jordan? Uh, metal objects tend to have a lot of highlights on them. And uh, depending on the angle, depending on the type of metal it is, uh, you can definitely exploit that. So some are gonna be like really shiny. And then if, but if you get like something like really rusted metal, like an old pipe or something like that, and it's starting to look all bronze and gross looking, then you might have to shift, uh, shift it to something a little bit more different. But a lot of it, that's what the reference is for. That's why um, actually part of the assignment when we were doing in school, uh, part of the assignment was to find like 10 or 15 reference photos and have it on the side of our image. Um, in the examples you're seeing, the photo references aren't really there, uh, but that's what we would have to do. We'd have to say, okay, I was looking at this, 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 and this. And we would look at it side by side and say, okay, you see how the highlight is here? You're not matching that. Or you see how the color shifts here and you're not getting it there. So we would we have to critique ourselves in that way. And that's why the photo reference is so reliable. Let's see, Lilac Canyon is saying, do you have to draw only food for the texture cubes? You don't. You can draw anything you want. And in fact, you guys, I think you're gonna really like this because some of you guys have been so ambitious that we are just continuing the art dare leap because people are really doing it. And it's phenomenal to see the quantity of work that people are getting done in just a month. So let's go over the art dare leap. Week one, texture of a candy. And yes, by the way, all of you who are talking about Sour Patch Kids, that is one of my favorite candies. I could eat those like all day, even when my tongue like burns. You ever eat so many that your tongue hurts? <laughs> you know, for me, it was Warheads that did that. It wasn't so, uh, Sour Patch Kids. But it was, oh, okay. <laughs> Warheads, oh, my, I, oh, those were the best. <laughs> and, and by the way, tell us in the chat, what is your favorite candy? Because like I was saying earlier, all the candy is different in the different countries because I went to Taiwan a few years ago and they have this candy, it's like stretched sugar, but it looks like scallions. And so it's called scallion candy, even though it's just sugar. And it's weird, like, it's like, God, this would be really cool to do. And then they also had this like nougat that I've never seen before. So tell us in the chat, what's your favorite candy? Because I'm so curious to learn about different candies that I'd never heard about before. I think that would be super fun. Um, Jordan, what's your favorite candy? We just have to know now. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite, um, when I was in middle school and high school, when I would get home from work, I would get Snickers every single day. <laughs> um, maybe not every single day, but like three days out of the week, I would just go, cause I'd have to walk, I would used to get off the bus and go to the gas station on the way home and I would pick up the king size Snickers. And the best the best was when I would go home and my aunt would sometimes surprise me like, Jordan, I got you a Snickers. I'd be like, thank you, this is, this is so great. I, oh man, and I would just have two Snickers. <laughs> Wait, like, like a full bar or yeah, are you talking about like the mini? No, the king size, like the, like the, the large ones, the ones that were like $3 or $4. <laughs> That's crazy, oh my goodness. Wow, we have a lot of, different candies here. Comcuke is saying Kit Kats and Kinder Eggs. I like those because they have little toys inside. And Neil seems to think we're all going to be diabetic watermelons. Jody Ann says strawberry Charleston chew. I didn't know that they made that. I thought it was just plain chocolate and white stuff. What is this? Gustavo Cocadas? What, what is that? Can somebody explain? I never heard about that before. That is really cool. Oh, wow, there's a whole bunch here. Geez, I don't think I'm gonna get through all of these, but there's a lot of really cool names in here. I see like yeah, Milky Way and Snickers in here. <laughs> Tamarind chili candy. Is it like hot and spicy? That's so weird. Oh, cool. And then what is this? Pelon Pelorico? Wow, I feel like I'm getting like this cultural tour of different candies. 
Oh, lilac. I understand the white rabbit candy. That that's a Chinese candy, Jordan. And it's so funny. My kids are used to eating it because I always get it when I go to Chinatown, and they were laughing so hard because I brought it to their like international light event, and the kids were all peeling the rice paper off. But you can eat the rice paper. My kids were like, "Why are you peeling it off? That's the best part." <laughs> So anyway, I thought that was pretty great. Let's see. And Phyllis Dong says, SpongeBob SquarePants gummy hamburger. Krabby <laughs> Patties. Come on. Anytime you talk about burger and SpongeBob, it's Krabby Patties. Come on. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'm so traumatized by that image. Anyway, let's look at week two. Texture of an insect. What do you think about this, Jordan? That one is going to terrify some people. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But I think it's a lot of fun. I remember one week we did uh, amber. We had to paint amber, and uh, our teacher wanted us to put a little bug in there so some people would have like a cockroach or an ant or a bee trapped in amber. It was, it was actually a lot of fun. Tell us in the chat if you guys know what kind of ant that is at the bottom. I, it's so weird looking. Like, I don't know why people are looking for extraterrestrial life when we have all these aliens like living right here on the planet. I mean, like, look at this weird caterpillar. So, really, really fun. Okay, week three is texture of a rock or a mineral. And what you guys might try doing is actually searching the Natural History Museum collections. Like, Jordan, have you ever been to the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C.? I don't think so. I've been to a lot of museums in D.C., but I don't know if I've been to that one. Yeah, that place is insane. Like, they just have, like, walls of rocks and minerals everywhere. And actually, I never was that into rocks before. I always thought they were sort of boring. But then I traveled to Utah last summer, and I just could not believe the rocks that were out there. So this is a really good one. Oh, WC wins. It was a honeypot ant. Very cool. Good job. All right, let's move on and look at week four, which is texture of a fantasy item. Anybody here know anything about Superman? Kryptonite does not exist. It's a fantasy item. So if you want to make a texture cube of what you think kryptonite is like, do it. Or if you want to make the texture of, tell us who that is on the right. Let's see who watched the movies in the 80s, unlike Jordan, who was, what, one years old? Uh, how about negative 10? <laughs> negative 10? Oh, my God. <laughs> or negative 5, actually, I guess. <laughs> but I think this is a really fun one. Like, people had said to me, oh, they could do, like, fairy dust or molten lava or I, I always feel like Jordan in a lot of movies rocks always glow like in Indiana Jones don't oh, they yeah. glow yeah in the the temple of don't temple of doom they definitely glow in that one yeah so use your imagination you guys you you can pull from anything it can be completely made up it can be from a series however you guys want to think about it but I think this is going to be really really fun yes Rose Smith is correct it's from Ghostbusters and this is a ghost named Slimer. And he's hilarious because he just like eats food like a maniac. And he's hilarious and adorable. So he was like, there's so much paraphernalia about Slimer in the 80s, Jordan. You missed this whole thing. <laughs> okay. So if you guys would like to see these examples, you can also read statements by Ruth and Karis and Victoria who are the artists that did these examples. And actually Jordan wrote step-by-step -step process on the lower right using Ruth's example. So for those of you who feel like you need a little bit more structure, you can follow that. Or if you wanna just dive in, that's terrific as well. However you guys wanna do it. And so just go to artprof.org, click on Art Dares and just click on 2020 July. This is good. I think we need to do unicorn poop. Mithril, is that from Lord of the Rings? I think it is, isn't it? The, well, you wouldn't know, Jordan. You've never watched Lord of the Rings. No, but <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I have to get the unicorn poop because I don't know if you've ever seen, they have these online, there's a commercial for this thing called Squatty Potty. I don't know if you, do you know what that is? <laughs> no. It, it basically helps you to go number two. And they had this commercial where they're literally like, there's uh, like a puppet unicorn and he's literally pooping and it's like rainbow, it's like ice cream. And so I see that, it was just 
it just made me think of it. Just look up Squatty Potty on YouTube later on. You'll, it's hilarious. I, I don't think I want to. <laughs> <laughs> great. I we have great. a question from Phoebe. Is there a specific number we have to do each week for the leap? No. The only thing for the leap is that you use rocks or minerals or insects. So number wise, it's totally up to you guys, however you want to do it. And Sumona is asking, are these all digital paintings? The ones on the site are all digital, but you don't have to do digital. You guys can use whatever material you want. So however you guys want to go about doing that. And we also have this tutorial, which is mixed media acrylic painting. But actually the inspiration for this tutorial was taste and texture. So it might be fun for you guys to see how Lauren explains it. And then if anybody wants to get started with digital painting and you want a couple tips, we do have this digital illustration tutorial with Kat Huang. And you guys can see me. Does everybody see me? I'm wearing a red shirt in the upper right-hand corner. My two little kids are maggots. One of them is wearing a diaper and they're on my back. <laughs> so if you want to see how that comes about creatively, you can watch this tutorial. And remember, we have lots of cool prizes. We give out mystery art supplies. If you are an international artist, you can get three months free access to our Discord voice channel. And we also offer portfolio critiques, website and Instagram critiques. But I think we all know a big part of the art there, it's not really the prizes, it's like the community, you guys getting to see what everybody else is doing. And we always end the art there with featured entries where we just pick a couple people to feature so we can see what everybody's doing. But keep in mind that you can also show us in Discord as well. We have a whole channel that's just art dares. Like Jordan, what do you think is the best part about everybody doing the same project at the same time? Uh you mentioned the community aspect, uh, and I think that that's always the big, the best part about doing anything like that because you're all in this together, and you're all either enjoying or suffering it together. Like, like some of the best memories I have from art school are when we're all in the studio, like two or three in the morning, and we're all delirious, singing Disney songs, and we're trying to make ourselves feel better. And I, we've done that plenty of times. <laughs> and and you're just there trying to learn from each other, trying to get feedback and stuff like that. And in this situation with Art Prof, since we're pretty much global and there's a ton of people all over the world doing it, it's much bigger than a 20 person classroom. So, uh, so yeah, there's a lot of fun you can have with that just by having a community. Let's see, Jay Cabby is asking, are we submitting these somewhere? Yes. So what you can do, we really prefer that people submit on Instagram and all you need to do, just tag us and use hashtag artprofshare and that way we will find it. However, if you are not on social media, what you can do instead is you can go to the July Art Dare page and there is a submission form there. So just find the button that says Art Dare submission form. You can upload there. So that's pretty easy. But we really prefer Instagram because it's just easier to stay on top of everything. So use all that and hang out with us on Discord. Jordan and I are going to be over there in about five or 10 minutes because, you know, we like to have our post stream parties. Yeah. Hang out and talk about honey ants and Sour Patch Kids. So join us on Discord. And we are going to be in the post live streams channel. So if you're looking for us, that's where we are. And subscribe to our channel and join the Art Prof family. And thank you, as always, to our top Patreon supporters who make everything possible. Looks like a lot of you guys are excited about doing your first art dare. And I'm thrilled to see that is going to be the first time for some of you guys. So let's dig in and see what you guys do this month. Everybody stay safe. We'll see you next time. Bye.